Oh, the Manhattan Project, I was trying to give you three easy things to remember about it. I think one of the most important things is that it harnessed the energy of the atom. And that was revolutionary. People think about um, man's conquering fire, man's discovery and ability to start and stop fire. This was what, it was akin to that level of revolution. It catapulted the country's science and technology. American science and technology was in the backwaters. There was very, very little government funding. Uh, the Smithsonian Institute existed, Andrew Carnegie, but beyond maybe Bell Lab, which was, again, a private institution, there was a lot of research done by the major corporations, but beyond that, there wasn't, you know, universities fully equipped with all kinds of um, equipment. It was, it was very um, much of a, a backwater. And then, one of the things, it did bring an end to World War II and possibly all future wars. That's the, you know, the dilemma we face today, but it's been 65 years and we still have not had a world-scale war of the type that ravaged the 20th century. Now, you guys have supplied me with um, Oak Ridge, where they made the uranium, Hanford, where they made the plutonium, and we talked about uh, Los Alamos. Um, but there were actually probably 38 states with this, this map, we can't show them all, um, with places that the companies like Chrysler, DuPont, Monsanto, GE, du you know, they were all involved in some aspect or other. Often they didn't know what their purpose was. I mean, they weren't told. They said, it's for the war effort, we need your help. Uh, so we really did, as Niels Bohr predicted, it can never be done unless you turn the United States into one huge factory. And that's what we did. What made the Manhattan Project work? There have been a lot of studies, you know, management, business schools, you know, study, you know, what are some of the greatest projects from a management point of view? What, is, what are the key ingredients? How do we get a man on the moon? How do we solve the problem of cancer, Parkinson, and other very hard to, to diagnose and cure diseases? Key thing is people. You've got to have extraordinary people, and they did. And they had a tangible goal. It's a lot easier. Um, this was a product, a physical, as some people say, as 90% engineering. I mean, the, they had the theories. They knew the theories in the 20s, if you could split an atom in such a way. They didn't know what element might work this way, but they had the theory that you could split an atom and then it could sustain this reaction. Um, Unlimited resources, that always helps. Groves had been busy building the Pentagon. And before that, he was in charge of all of the Army's pre-war buildup. And he had a budget that was four times as big as the Manhattan Project before the war. In fact, he didn't want the assignment. When they said, hey, we got a job for you, he said, gee, I want to go, I want to go to Europe. I want to be on the front. I've been trained at West Point. I want to, you know, I want to see some action. But they knew that he was the man. He had the contacts in industry. He could pull this together. And uh, he then negotiated, OK, if I'm going to do the job, I want a blank check. So he was able to get that. And above all, it had a moral purpose. That's something I think people forget. And they wonder, well, why did these scientists agree to work on this project with this horrible weapon? Well, in the context of the time, it was to, to guarantee the freedom of democracy, to keep England from, from uh, being taken over by Hitler and the same, and coming across here and taking out Washington, New York, and then the rest of the country. We could all be speaking German. Uh, I mean, it was a real threat that um, the fascists would, would uh, rule the world. And the moral purpose was we were, we were going to, you know, restore a world and, and uh, defeat, defeat fascism, keep the world free for democracy. General Groves uh, was probably the most decisive person. He did not allow himself more than an hour to make a decision. 
And he was making decisions. The whole project ended up costing, tw in today's terms, could be 30 billion. Um, it was 2.2 billion then, but it's, it's you know, somewhere between 25 and 30 billion in today's dollars. And he didn't hesitate to change his mind if he felt there was another way to do, be do this or that was more promising. And um, even if it cost tens of hundreds of millions of dollars, I mean, he just, he generally didn't retract, but in a couple cases, and after this one particular decision, someone asked him, how can you go play tennis now? You've just made this huge decision and, and uh, we're gonna have to tear out all of this equipment we've installed in Oak Ridge and so forth. And he said, the time to worry about a decision is before you make it, not after." Oppenheimer, on the other hand, uh, was a far more high-strung, sensitive person. And one of the beauties of the relationship between the two of them was that Groves, who could be an SOB, and that's a quote directly from one of his lieutenants, um, he knew how to play Oppenheimer. He knew that he should keep him calm. He needed to be focused to do his work. He tried, uh, he knew that in order for him, General Groves, to succeed, he needed Oppenheimer. There was a clash, a military versus a scientist. Um, Groves was preoccupied with espionage, that we would leak this, that it would get to the Soviets, uh, or the Germans, or the Italians, one of our enemies. It, so it, Soviet, our relationships were kind of iffy, um, even though they were nominally part of the Allies. Uh, and we, we, we supported them in fighting, but we were, we were, they were swarming Berkeley. Um, they had a lot of uh, intelligence officers here in, in New Mexico trying to um, get as much as information as they could about the bomb and about our work here. Anyway, to, to prevent that, Groves wanted no one to know more than they needed to know. And he did not want the scientists to talk to each other, uh, which was anathema to the scientists. They had to share information to collaborate. And the compromise was that instead of having these scientists scattered all over the country and universities, they would pull them together in this isolated place called Los Alamos, and the military would run it. They backed down, the military backed down. They wouldn't have to put the scientists in military uniform. That was ludicrous. <laughs> anyway, any rate, but they, and they allowed uh, colloquia. Every week, Oppenheimer would pull together a room full of people like this, and someone would present his problem, and everybody would help participate in solving it. That tough, tough problem of how do you configure a bomb that has plutonium at the core, the implosion device, one of the key insights came from a man named Nick Metropolis, who was a mathematician first and foremost. The Manhattan Project was the beginning of the national security state in which the executive branch, I mean, General Groves basically created his own FBI, his own counterintelligence agency, his own CIA equivalent. He didn't trust, you know, depending on Herbert Hoover or whatever for his information. We focus a lot in this about the bomb because that's what the Manhattan Pro Project was produced first, but uh, soon after followed uh, nuclear power, Medicine, genome, the Human Genome Project was really a Department of Energy and its predecessor, Atomic Energy Commission funding, because they wanted to figure out what are the, what are the effects of radiation on um, reproductive systems. So they did all of this work on the Human Genome Project and funded that. Material science, how do you build stronger buildings? Uh, that is all part of, um, enabled by um, the ability to look at uh, radioactive properties and, and uh, test, test uh, the strength of materials and, and invent new materials. Outer space exploration wouldn't be possible without uh, radioactive cesium-based um, batteries, I guess you call them, generators. Uh, nanotechnology was born. Um, High-speed computing. I mean, so much of what we have today, they didn't even have to think that they didn't even have what we think of a computer to work with. 
Manhattan Project turned everything around. Um, it brought together the resources of industry, the brilliance of academia, and the government. And after the war, the people involved who saw such a transformation that could be made, how much progress we could make in science and technology if there were government support and bringing in the resources of industry, that uh, they continued. They created the, what they called the National Laboratory System.